Like Adam said, I am T I'm TJ Van Toll. I'm a UI team member, work for Liquid Web, Lansing, Michigan. And I'm here to talk about UI widgets, specifically jQuery UI widgets, against kind of their HTML5 counterparts. And what I mean by that is as browsers implement more and more of these um, HTML5 features, we're really at a point where we have two different widgets that perform basically the same function. For example, this is Chrome's implementation of input type date. And here's a UI date picker. Pretty similar. Um, input type number versus spinner, range versus slider. Um, and the other one I have up here in data is data list versus autocomplete. There's plenty of other examples. And this leaves developers at a situation where you essentially have to kind of pick one or the other. Um, we haven't really had this problem before because support really hasn't been there. It's only recently that this sort of thing has come up. And we kind of got here because historically, making things like forms has been pretty limited in the browser. This is the complete set of form controls that are really safe to use if you want comprehensive browser support today. And there's not much here. You have text boxes, passwords, radios, checkboxes. Um, these four are essentially just buttons. They're not really means of collecting user input. And then, of course, you have drop downs and text areas. And what's interesting about this is that these same controls were pretty much the same set of controls that were safe to use 15 years ago. There really has been a lot of stagnation in this area. And it's only recently with the HTML5 spec that we've actually been able to do more. Some things have happened, though, in the last 15 years. And we got better at building some widgets to kind of implement this ourselves it, through libraries like jQuery, through Mutil's prototype Dojo, um, and plenty of others. And we could build it on top of them. So we kind of filled the holes where the spec didn't have implementations and just basically built our own with JavaScript. But the other thing that happened in the last 15 years is we went from just building these very basic forms to collect data and to some really complex forms. And we, the, the whole profession of UX really became a thing on the web. And we, people discovered, hey, we could make money off our web forms. And we want to optimize them to collect data as fastly and easily as possible. So the HTML5 spec, this is one of the major things that it addressed, trying to put some of these features natively into the browser itself. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about a couple widgets in particular and kind of um, compare and contrast the native control versus the UI control. And then at the end, we'll kind of discuss what makes the most sense for you. The most obvious example of this, the one that we know from download statistics, for instance, of UI, that date picker is our most popular widget. And um, you can see that they're, they're pretty similar. To create a native date picker, all you have to do is give an input, a type of date. And date picker, UI's date picker, you select the element, you call date picker on it, you have a date picker. Now, the, the native support for date pickers is, is not all that great. It's been in Chrome stable for a while now. Um, some of the mobile browsers, iOS has had support for a while. And the, the most recent, Chrome for Android, now has a date picker in it as well. Opera's had it for a while, but still missing out on IE and Firefox. Some of the pros of the native date picker, um, it's dependency free. Uh, if we go back to this example here, one thing you're not seeing is in order to make this date picker, you have to include jQuery. You have to include jQuery UI's script. You have to include UI's date picker CSS. And the native picker, you don't have to worry about that at all. It's just built into the browser. It'll work without JavaScript. It's also easy. Um, it's, it's a lot less typing. Date picker. You get some integration into some other native features. Um, this is a date picker in, with, using the min, max, and step attributes. And the way Chrome implements this, it might be hard to see with the contrast here, but it's actually disabled. I've, I've picked two dates between March 3rd and March, 20, and March 20th, and Chrome actually won't let me change the, the month of the year. It'll only let me change the day. And it'll also, with the step attribute, only allow me to pick every other day. You can kind of see it with the contrast there, hovering over there. The other, the other big native hook is constraint validation, which is another HTML5 spec for native form validation. Now, most of this kind of is done implicitly. What this means is that the browser is going to enforce that if a form has an input of type date in it, it will 
be, it'll make sure that the user actually types a date before allowing that data to actually be submitted. And Chrome takes care of this largely because I can't, uh, like if I type letters, um, it's just not gonna let me type them. But it'll also handle more advanced cases like, um, let's say I want a date that doesn't make sense, it'll stop that from actually being submitted. How many people in here have written leap year logic before for a form? Right, you know, you people should be pretty excited about this because it's, it's a pain and it's nice that the browser can actually do this natively. The other thing is that you get the full constraint validation API, which I'm not gonna go into too much, but I just have a quick example here. This set custom validity method, I can call it with, if you call it with an empty string, it's a weird API that means the field is valid, of course. If you call it with a non-empty string, it'll set it as the message. And what I'm doing here is I just um, don't like sevens, so I can just do this custom thing and just um, prevent sevens if I wanted to do that. And if I gave it a valid date, though, um, the browser will just let me submit it. And all that's just kind of baked in. The other big native feature that you get is integration with Daedalus. The way Daedalus works is you give an input element a list attribute. That list attribute needs to correspond with the ID of a data list element. And the difference between data list and say a select, um, selects you give options and the browser will enforce that the user pick one of those values. Um, data lists are just suggestions. You're just suggesting to the user. It's kind of like the browser's autocomplete. And for date pickers, the way Chrome implements this is the options it'll show kind of um, drop down style so that you can pre-select them. But then since they are just suggestions, you can go to this other option and bring up the full picker. The big one though for the native support is that by giving control over to the browser to implement this control, the browser can customize and optimize the means that that data is collected. Um, I have up here what iOS and Chrome for Android do to implement these date pickers, and these are really nice. Not only is it easier for the user, but it's also the controls that the user is used to. It's similar with the, or basically the same control the OS provides natively. If you go into iOS's calendar, that's the same picker you're gonna get as when you use an input type date, which is really nice for the end user. And those are kind of some of the pros of the native control, but I wanted to get into some of the problems. And it's mostly that you, you kind of, you have to take what you get. You don't get a whole lot of control over how they look, how they work, um, and how they behave. And this really isn't anything new for form controls. How many people here have tried to do anything non-trivial to change the look or behavior of a select element? How did that end? <laughs> <laughs> and it's no different with these native pickers. You, it's nice and easy, but you kind of have to take what you get. The other problem still is browser support. Um, it is in Chrome stable. It is in the latest version of the, the big mobile browsers, but you're still leaving out a lot of users, IE and Firefox specifically. To contrast that, let's take a quick look at UI's date picker. You'll get a lot of the same controls. Um, I'm just gonna show a scattering of the options. Min and max days, that's implemented. Um, you can restrict available days. This is quite a bit more powerful than say the step attribute. Um, Basically, this before show day is just a function where you can whitelist or blacklist days. It'll get called once per day, and you can say, I don't want them to pick March 3rd. Or the, the no weekends is just a little helper function to block out weekends. They're themable. Uh, let's go with Trontastic. Yeah. Um, that's a nice looking day picker. Um, so you have control over the look, full control. Um, you can do things like show multiple months. There's, there's a bunch of little controls you can do. You can animate them, yay. Um, it's got the full UI effects library behind them so you can do things like this if that's what you wanna do. Um, you can show and hide them and this seems very, very trivial but this is something, even something this basic, just changing the display is something you can't do with the native control so even things like that and a lot more. Um, the date picker has a lot of options that have accumulated over time, maybe more than there should be, but there's a lot that you can do. And the big factor here, the big, the main advantage and part of the disadvantage of a JavaScript-based control is that it's just HTML on the DOM. 
And this is incredibly powerful because you can see this HTML here, and you can just go into it with JavaScript and customize it however you'd like. You can get rid of some things, add some things, whatever. You also have the full power of CSS. You don't have to worry about how things are going to hit this, but just worry about the structure and do whatever you want. So if you need a date picker that looks like this, <laughs> go for it. This is actually still usable, too, which is kind of fun. Um, it, does have to, it does have to repaint the, the picker so the animation doesn't stay fluent, but yeah. But, but this is kind of also a, a detriment of having just HTML on the DOM is because it's available and because you can do anything with it, third-party scripts also can. So they can kind of mess with your content on there. You don't get good encapsulation. Um, the date picker uses tables and anchor tags, and if you have CSS that applies global rules to these things, well, they're going to hit your date picker as well, and you have to worry about how that interacts. So that's something that like, the, the, the web component specification tries to tackle, and we'll get into that in a little bit. So just a, a very brief comparison. The, the native picker is easy, um, dependency-free, you get ties in the native features, looks sweet on mobile. Uh, but the date picker, the UI's date picker, is kind of battle-tested. Um, it's very customizable. You can do a lot with it. And there's a lot of options that are pre-baked in. You also get browser support. UI's date picker is going to work back to IE7. The previous version works in IE6 if you need that. The next question that usually comes up is, well, can we get the best of both worlds? Um, I like the, 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 the date picker validation or the, the date validation. It's really nice. But then I also want the customizable widget. I need to do some non-trivial things with dates. And the problem that happens, the, the, the kind of naive approach to this is, well, I have an input of type date, and I call date picker on it. What could go wrong? Um, and it turns out you get this kind of like double calendar thing. And like the native one actually does still work, but then this kind of does nothing. So yeah. Uh, um, one thing that we can do, though, um, the part of the web components family of specifications is a concept known as shadow DOM. And what this is, is how the browser actually implements these controls. In Chrome, oops, in Chrome there's this option in the config down here that shows Shadow DOM. And if you turn this on, so normally input elements cannot have children. But you can see now in Chrome that I can actually drill into this. And I can see a shadow root here. And I have some information about how this is actually implemented. And so I can do things like actually change some of the native control, which is kind of slick. And if you take an approach like this, you can actually kind of get something that sort of works. You can just kind of hide things. That spin button is the little the spin control that moves the, the data up and down. I can kind of hide the arrow. Um, there's also pseudo elements for all of this. You can hide the MM, all this text you can get rid of, too, if you so choose, or change the color, or whatever. Um, and it turns out, if you hide both of those and you give the, the date picker a date format of uh, this, whatever this is, which that just happens to be the, the format that the native picker expects, that you can get something that kind of works. Well, it actually does work pretty well. Um, which is pretty cool. Um, and WebKit has a lot of these elements that they expose. The problem with this, of course, is that this is a solution that's incredibly specific to Chrome Desktop at the moment. And essentially, in Presto, there's no pseudo elements exposed. And IE and Gecko have no support for date pickers yet. But you can bet that if you relied on this route, that you're going to have some problems when implement implementations come later. Presto, you'd still get the double date picker, iOS, yep, Chrome for Android as well. To answer this question, can we get the best of both worlds, the answer is unfortunately no right now. You really can't. You are at a situation where you have to pick one or the other that makes sense. Now, UI's date picker does make a good polyfill, so you can detect whether support is present. And if it isn't, you can enhance it with a UI date picker. And this works really well if you just need a date. You don't need anything special, but you need a date from the user then you can be sure that you always get some sort of control, the native picker or UIs when support isn't there. The next one I want to talk about is number pickers. And I'm going to go kind of quickly through this, because you're going to find that it's kind of the same story being told over again. 
Number pickers have this, uh, basically it's just type number instead of type date. And essentially if I go up and down on the keyboard here, the, um, the value will be spent, well, will spin. UI spinner works similarly. Support for type number is a little better than date. Chrome's had it for a long time, but it's also in desktop Safari. Um, the mobile support is, um, is a little bit better, and it's been in Opera for a while as well. Still no IE or Firefox support. The reasons to use the number picker are basically the same. It's, it's very easy to use. It's dependency free. Um, mobile browsers can optimize the keyboard for you. In Chrome for Android, it'll pop up this keyboard instead of the, the standard QWERTY keyboard. In iOS, you get the, the, again, you get the number picker. And if you like the dialer, you can give it a pattern attribute and get a really nice um, input means for the user. Opera Mobile is the only mobile browser that supports uh, the min and max and step attributes on number pickers. And I have mixed feelings about this because those up and down things seem really small, but they're there. Um, the number picker also gives you um, integration with the min, max, and step attributes. And if I just use the keyboard, the browser automatically step me by values of two and restrict me at zero and 10. Those also hook into the constraint validation API. So if I have a form and I go outside these bounds I specified, the browser will actually prevent that, value, that form from being submitted and give the user an error message um, automatically, dependency free. I really have to, it's fresh. The other one I was gonna show is, same thing if you go above, it'll stop it. And it'll also stop it if you um, validate or go against the step attribute. In this case, I need to have a multiple of two. But if I, if I provide a valid value, it'll let that go. You also get data list integration. The way Chrome implements this, uh, number pickers is just kind of like a standard text box autocomplete that um, I get this sort of thing. The limitations of the number picker are essentially the same. Um, you're not gonna be able to do a whole lot with these things. Um, and again, browser support's a little better, but still not all that great. UI spinner to contrast, um, it, the same basic story. You get support for min, max, and step attributes. It's smart enough to look at the attributes on the input, and so you don't have to actually specify those as options. It's again, themable. Um, Swanky purse? I don't even know exactly what this is. Oh, there we go, yes. Um, paging, um, we'll see why this is kind of cool in a minute, but um, the step value here is one, so if I go up and down, I, I go up and down by one, but I can also page up and page down, and it'll use a value of 10 here. Um, where this gets kind of cool, um, Spinner has some hooks into another jQuery project, Globalize, so you can kind of get some internationalization. This C here is saying that I want a currency value, and out of the box, it'll give me this nice little currency spinner that I can use. And for if, as long as you load the locales, you can get support for other types of currency. I can switch to yen, or uh, euros here, and then also switch to yen. Pretty straightforward. The big thing, though, is that these, thing, these widgets are very extensible as well. This is an example that's on jQuery UI's demo site, and it's just showing how, since Spinner is built on the widget factory, you can extend it pretty easily to add some custom behavior. This is just a few lines of code, um, adding the, defaulting the step value to seconds, um, defaulting the page value to hours, and just a couple lines of code to parse the values back and forth in each direction. And just from that, you can get a little time picker that up and down will move the seconds, and if I page, it'll move hours, spin around. I can change the culture again. And remember what key, there you go. And it'll spin around as well. And again, a lot more. There's, um, there's a lot more that I could possibly go into in this amount of time. It's just HTML in the DOM, so you can make a spinner dance if you want. Uh, I spent some time trying to think of what moves would make a spinner most look like it's dancing. To keep this actually practical, I made a spinner to control the one that's, that's dancing. So I can do something like this. 
you're not going to be able to do that with a native picker, so. <laughs> Can we get the best of both worlds? The, the same question again. Um, if you take the naive approach and try to make a spinner into a number picker, you again get this sort of thing. These controls actually will, will both work, so kind of okay, but it's pretty confusing to users. Um, with Shadow DOM again, um, you get something that's actually pretty darn usable in WebKit. The, the native validation is still going to work here, um, and you get none of the native UI. So you actually can kind of get something to work in, in Chrome at the moment, but I mean, again, the problem is that it's, it's a very specific solution to that browser and not a solution that's really um, something that's maintainable for the future as more implementations of this come up. So the answer is uh, to this question right now for number pickers is, well, not really. I mean, you can't really build something that's sustainable for the future. Again, Spinner makes a good polyfill. If you just need a number picker, um, you can make up for the lack of number support with a spinner. The, the last widget I'm going to go through is range pickers. And I'm going to go through this even quicker because it's, again, pretty much the same story. The browser's range picker, this is how Chrome has it implemented. This is what UI slider, which is essentially the equivalent, looks like. Range support is actually pretty good. It's shipped in IE 10. It's also in Firefox nightly, I believe. I don't think it's actually hit stable yet. It's in Safari and Opera, and most of the mobile browsers now have support as well. You again get optimized input. Um, this is how iOS's range look. This is how um, Chrome for Android's range looks. Um, IE 10s is pretty slick, actually. They give this little tool tip that shows you the value as you move it, which is kind of nice because, especially with something like this, you almost kind of have to build that yourself because no one would have any idea what they're sliding. Min, max, and step again. Um, as you step down, I just have a little code here to output it, but the browser will, will snap to the steps and enforce those mins and maxes. Data list integration. Um, I don't know where the little ticks went. Um, Chrome will, will usually put up a little tick mark where these options are. Um, and I, this might be impossible to see, but it'll actually snap to those values. Without the ticks, it's kind of uh, hard to show this. IE also does something similar. These little um, white lines here would correspond to data list options to kind of show the user um, suggested points. And you actually get quite a few pseudo elements you can use to play with these things. Um, you're not going to get something that looks the same across these browsers by any means, but um, to keep the practical examples going, you can make something that looks like this. Um, this is Firefox IE and Chrome left to right. UI slider to contrast, you're again going to get min, max, and step attributes. Um, it'll again, the behavior is pretty similar. Themable. Uh, switch it up. You can do things like multiple handles, or you can create ranges. You can do animation, um, and again, a lot more. Um, you can do something like this. And again, because I wanted to keep things practical, I made a slider to control the rate that this slider spins. And this is, again, still usable, um, still keyboard accessible. <laughs> and it's extensible. Um, this is a really slick example that we saw someone build. And, and first of all, it adds on these little labels automatically to the little handles, which is cool. That updates as you drag. But what's really slick about this is when you get these things close, it really nicely combines these. And then it's smart enough, too, that when they're on top of each other, it brings it down to one value. And this is really, really nice and well done. And the code for this is actually pretty small. It's like 40, 50 lines of code. It, it wasn't written as an extension of the, the slider, but it easily could have been. And it probably would have made it more reusable code. To kind of summarize what we've talked about, um, the, the native features are, are very easy to use. Um, and you don't have any dependencies. You don't have to worry about loading scripts. The user agent can optimize the input. Um, you get the nice pickers on mobile. Hooks into other native functionality, things like data lists, um, things like uh, the constraint validation, native uh, validation. 
But you do have problems with lack of browser support. It's getting better. But if you're deploying a production app right now, chances are you can't leave out like Firefox and Internet Explorer, even the latest versions. But you're really not going to have much control over these things. Um, they're not really very, you can kind of do some things to style them, but not really. Um, you really can't customize or extend on top of them. So this really leaves us in a situation where right now you have to pick one or the other. And which you pick kind of just depends on your application. But really, if you just need the very basic thing, I just need a date from the user, I just need a number from the user, you probably want to try to be considering using the native element. And since browser support probably will be an issue, you could look into using um, some sort of polyfill. I would recommend UI, obviously. But you can even, if you're worried about the size of UI, you can conditionally load it, get into things like that. But trying to get these things to work together is just going to be painful. And it's probably not even going to be possible in most cases. So this comes up a lot, um, that we want to actually get the best of both worlds, right? We want a date picker that will tie into the native validation, but that we can also just kind of provide our own calendars to implement this. And there have been several proposed solutions to this problem. This is one that was on the mailing list. I don't know actually who, whose idea this was originally, but like maybe we could provide some sort of attribute that says, tells the browser, hey, um, I actually just don't want you to provide any picker for this. I got this. But if you give me the ties into the other stuff, that would be great. And the blanket, the blanket response that kind of comes from the people who actually work on the specification is that the long-term solution for this is web components. Web components is going to be how we solve these problems in the future. And what exactly does that mean? Um, in, in this case, basically, um, we looked earlier at the date picker, and we could drill into it and see the actual Shadow DOM implementation in Chrome. The idea is that in the future, you'd be able to inject your own Shadow DOM element in there, and the browser would know that to use that instead of the native implementation. And then you'd get all the benefits of the encapsulation um, and all the power that Shadow DOM comes with, which sounds great. Um, but there's a problem in that it's not implemented anywhere yet. It's basically just in some people's heads. Um, in Chrome, Chrome's the only browser that has Shadow DOM support, at least in stable release. And if you try to get a reference to the shadow root of an input element, it's just going to tell you that it's not there, it doesn't exist. If you try to create a new shadow root for that input element, it will throw an exception. You, you just can't do it yet. The other potential solution for this long term is to utilize HTML custom elements. Custom elements are another specification that falls under the web components spectrum. And it's basically just a means of creating your own custom HTML elements, defining some things like the behavior it, uh, behavior it and so forth. The, the long term idea is that eventually you'll be able to create custom form elements and tell the browser things like what value is going to be submitted from this control how this control um, can be validated, things like that. But this is something that's even more far, uh, more far off, because this is in the heads of a few of the spec writers. This actually hasn't been put on paper or anything yet. So unfortunately, we don't have a solution to this problem at the moment. You're, you're basically stuck picking one or the other. Now, one thing that we can do, jQuery UI specifically can do, is try to help make the native controls as best as they can be jQuery UI has an interesting position in that a lot of these controls that are ending up in the browser have been in the wild and UI for years, and we kind of have an idea of what works and what doesn't. To give some examples of this, input or number pickers have step up and step down methods that you can call on them, which seem pretty self-explanatory. They, they take an optional number of steps. Here you can see the value of this input is one. If you call step, on it, step up on it with three, it's telling it that's three steps. And so the value changes to 4. If you don't provide it, um, the, value, the default value is 1. And what's interesting, though, is that the very first way, when this was first written up, the default value of, or the, the default value if you didn't pass a parameter was 0. So calling step up and step down would actually do nothing. And that's something where we can provide feedback and say, like, yeah, we actually have step up and step down methods. And this is kind of how they should work. The other one that just, um, that just went on the, around the mailing list was the orientation of ranges. And so basically, horizontal ranges versus vertical ranges. 
the way the spec's written up, the basically horizontal versus vertical should be determined based off the height and the width of the control. And if you look here, Chrome actually doesn't implement this per the specification. I have a width of 10 pixels on this control and a height of 100 pixels, which per the spec, this thing should be vertical. And actually, the only browser this will be vertical in right now is Opera. The way Chrome has this implemented is through this proprietary pseudo class, WebKit Appearance Slider Vertical, which of course makes the thing vertical. Now for UI slider, this actually came up um, because the slider has an orientation option. And years ago, it used to default to a value of auto. And what auto would do is it would try to figure it out for you. And it turns out that this was not a good idea because people would use sliders uh, across, like, say, a large application, and then suddenly, one place they put a slider, their slider would magically become vertical. And what we decided on was orientation should just take two options, horizontal and vertical. And it defaults to horizontal because that's what most people want, but you have an easy way of making it vertical. And this is actually basically the, the way Chrome has implemented it, actually. But so far, it's still in the spec that height and width kind of drive these things. But we can at least provide feedback to say, try to make the, the native controls as usable and easy as possible. We want the things that should, the very common use cases to be as easy as they can be. The last thing I want to talk about is, um, with a lot of the, the progress that has been made in implementation of some of these controls, things like date pickers actually landing in browsers and whatnot, um, that still doesn't mean that these JavaScript widgets and these UI frameworks are going away. If anything, it almost means the opposite. There's no way, if you look at all the options that Date Picker provides or a lot of these widgets provide, there's no way those things are making it into the specification. There's just too much. There's too, much, too many things that people want to do. And what jQuery UI and a lot of JavaScript widget frameworks try to provide is a nice baseline that you can build widgets on top of and handle those more complex situations that are going to really be unique and hard to actually make part of any sort of specifications. Where, where the UI widgets are basically going, though, is moving more towards um, web components and, taking, and getting rid of some of the disadvantages of, the, of using these widgets, things like what Google's Polymer project is doing, um, and actually creating encapsulated reusable widgets. But JavaScript widgets aren't going anywhere. Um, we know from usage trends that um, more and more people are actually downloading and using UI. These things are getting more popular. They're getting more powerful. And if you want to help, we're always looking for help. Help be part of the future of the web. That's it. Thanks. <laughs> Looks like I have about five minutes for questions, I think. I see Adam lurking in the back. I'm working on getting the mic. Right now we're going with the Yelly system. Yell. Uh, so ahead and get started. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to use the uh, thought about taking a shot for a JQuery UI element and having an option that says if there's a native replacement, you can add So the, the question was, has there been any thought of um, essentially detecting support within jQuery UI and just using the native element when it's available? And no, not really. Um, we basically just leave it up to the user to, to figure out what they want to use, essentially. It doesn't seem like that answered your question. <laughs> Well, yeah, the plan is to make more of the, the UI widgets more mobile friendly. It's, it's hard for us to, to integrate with some of the native features. Like, that's basically the problems we talked about. But the plan is to make these UI widgets more responsive, more friendly for mobile devices. OK. Uh, it would be great if people were just like nice and like quiet while they left, because so, we're doing this. Um, what about elements outside of the form? Um, the accordion or tabs or anything like that. Is there any parity you know, between HTML5 and jQuery UI outside of form elements? Yeah, like the, the progress bar. Progress bar is, is kind of a form element. That, that's one example. Um, it's, it's, the same, it's the same basic thing. Um, you, you essentially have to choose one or the other. There's, there's less advantages of the, the native control there. Um, 
you don't get like the, the mobile input, the uh, data list, the form validation, things like that. So there's less of a need, I think, to use the native elements because chances are you don't want to care about browser support for those type things. So that's why I didn't necessarily contract, uh, concentrate on those because I think there's more advantages of the, the form controls in the native form controls, that is. Um, I had a question about, um, do you guys have any plans to um, put any input to the native, to the specification, uh, like um, any suggestions to change the native, native state of the web right now? Um, was, were you asking like, any plans to like, change the native controls? Like just or? putting more input to the actual specification of HTML5 with a lot of the jQuery UI customizations. I'm sorry, could you? I don't know if you're not understanding. You, what he's saying is like, instead of making our own date picker, why don't we just go and be like, the browser date picker should be better. Oh, OK. Yeah, and we, we try to do that. Uh, but again, the, the problem is that the, the native thing can only handle so much. There, there's only so much time. There's only so much that can be put. There's a lot of work that goes into getting these things part of the specification and then actually implemented in browsers and getting browser vendors to agree on it and making something that's really reusable. So that can really, we, we try to give feedback on the parts that we don't think work right, um, but there's only so much we can do. The, the native controls really concentrates on the, the really common use cases. Like I need, I have a form and I need a date that I can submit to the server type deal. So I just want to expand on that. We do work closely with uh, WattWG and W3C. Uh, we also work closely with TC39, but that's like irrelevant to the form controls. Um, one of the things that we do work on is like the extend the web forward and the extensible web manifesto type stuff. So while input type equals date is not something that we will ever be able to use inside jQuery UI, the building blocks for getting there are. And so figuring out how the browsers can expose the underlying behavior, or like all of the validation that's built into input type equals date, how do you use that in a custom element? Uh, so we work on the, the lower primitives, like how do we expose that so that script libraries can take advantage of it? Anybody else? Let's give TJ a last round of applause.